Hello students, welcome to our session today which is going to talk about dealing with patients suffering with chronic illnesses. When I say chronic illnesses, you might be imagining people who are old, who are adults at least and who always suffer with some problem or the other. Let me share two small anecdotes with you. During a school sports meet, a young runner was caught in the grips of an asthma attack. As she frantically searched through her bag for her inhaler, three other girls on the team have offered theirs. Jayanth, a school-going boy aged 10 years, was in tears when his mother refused to send him for a birthday party of his friend. Why am I pro prohibited from eating a cake or an ice cream or at least a chocolate? All my friends do. Why is my diet so different from that of the others? Jayanth was repeatedly questioning his mother. His mother was in tears too. The child was diagnosed recently with diabetes. These are some of the examples that I, I can give you immediately to indicate the alarming rates at which the chronic illnesses are affecting the population across any age group. At any given point in time, 50% of the population is supposed to be having some chronic health condition. These conditions are not confined, as I said, only to the elderly. Studies have shown that more than one third of young adults between the ages of 18 to 44 have at least one chronic health condition. In developed countries, approximately one in three people at any given point in time has a chronic disease. Statistics also indicate that non-communicable or chronic or long-term diseases are now the leading cause of deaths worldwide. In India, chronic diseases are projected to account for 53% of the deaths. While the total projected deaths in India in 2005 were 1,3,62,000, total projected deaths due to chronic diseases were 54 lakhs and 66,000. According to WHO report, chronic diseases account for approximately 80% of deaths in developed countries. Chronic conditions range from relatively mild ones like partial hearing loss to severe and life-threatening disorders like cancer, coronary artery disease and diabetes and many others. They also include disorders like epilepsy, arthritis, chronic fatigue syndrome, asthma, hypertension, liver disease, dementia and others. What would the impact of chronic illnesses be on an individual? The onset and knowing about the diagnosis of the chronic disease that he is undergoing itself brings about profound changes in a person's life. This can lead to a reduced quality of life and well-being. It raises significant challenges. Let us talk about these challenges first. Adjusting to the symptoms and the disability that these, the disease is going to produce. Maintaining a reasonable emotional balance. Preserving a satisfactory self-image and sense of competence as well. Learning about symptoms, treatment procedures and self-management. Sustaining relationships with family and friends, forming and maintaining relationships with healthcare providers and preparing for the uncertain future. The enormity of all these tasks coupled with the emotional distress brought on by the chronic illness mean patients are at high risk of depression. For example, studies of people with multiple sclerosis found between 16 to 54 percent of them were severely depressed. Crisis theory of chronic illness assumes that we need a social and psychological equilibrium which is similar to homeostasis. I hope you all know what homeostasis means. The diagnosis of an illness can put someone in an extreme state of disequilibrium which is accompanied by negative emotions like fear, anxiety and depression. The demands of illness are more likely to overwhelm a person if they have existing psychological problems already or make negative or catastrophic appraisals of the situation 
and also have poor coping skills and resources. Learned helplessness occurs when people believe that they have no control over events, they become hopeless, helpless and subsequently depressed as Seligman says. This is particularly relevant to chronic illness. If people believe that they have no control over their illness or outcome that it can lead to, then it may lead to detachment, withdrawal and depression. In chronic illnesses, the emphasis of treatment thus will be upon improving the quality of life of the person along with the cure curing of the illness. Once the person is diagnosed with a chronic illness, there may be several psychological responses from his side. Many chronic illnesses in fact affect many aspects of patient's life. Immediately after a chronic disease is diagnosed, they can be in a state of crisis marked by physical, social and psychological disequilibrium as we have just discussed. They find that their habitual ways of coping with problems do not work now. The result can be an exaggeration of their symptoms and their meaning, indiscriminate efforts to cope, increasingly neurotic attitudes and worsening health. Anxiety, fear and depression may temporarily take over. Eventually, the crisis phase of this chronic illness passes and the patient begins to develop a sense of how the chronic illness will alter their lives. Now, let us discuss some of the major consequences of chronic illness. The first and foremost that we would discuss is denial. Well, denial is a defense mechanism by which people avoid, in this context, the implications of an illness. It's a common reaction to chronic illness that has been observed among heart patients, stroke patients, cancer patients and others. Patients may act as if the illness were not severe, as if it will shortly go away or as if it will have very few long-term implications. Immediately after the diagnosis of illness, during their acute phase of illness, denial can serve a protective function. How? How can denial serve a protective function? Think. Denial can mask the fear associated with a chronic disease until the patient is more accustomed to the diagnosis and better able to sort out realistically the restrictions that the illness will pose. However, during the rehabilitative phase of illness, denial may have adverse effects if it interferes with the ability to take necessary information. When patients must be actively involved with the treatment regimen, absorb the information which is given to them and comply with medications and whatever is recommended by the specialist and as well as the ch other changes in the lifestyle, denial can be an impediment. Another psychological reaction predictably is anxiety. Many patients become overwhelmed by the potential changes in their lives and in some cases by the prospect of death. Anxiety is especially high when people are waiting for test results, receiving diagnosis, awaiting invasive medical procedures and anticipating or experiencing adverse side effects of treatment according to researchers. It is seen that anxiety is also high when people expect substantial lifestyle changes to result from an illness or its treatment when they feel dependent on health professionals, when they experience concern over recurrence and when they lack information about the nature of illness and its treatment. Studies have also demonstrated that although anxiety directly attributable to the disease may decrease over time, anxiety about possible complications, the disease's implications for future and its impact on work and leisure time activities as well may actually increase with time. Another important consequence that we have to study about is depression. In fact, several studies have been performed upon depression as a consequence. Studies show that up to one third of 
all medical in patients with chronic diseases report at least moderate symptoms of depression and up to one quarter suffer from severe depression. Depression exacerbates the risk and course of several chronic disorders, most notably coronary heart disease. I am telling you about the results of certain studies which have been performed in this context. Depression complicates treatment adherence and medical decision making. It interferes with patients adopting a co-managerial role and it confers enhanced risk of mortality from a broad array of chronic diseases. Depression is important not only because of the risk and distress that it produces but also because it has an impact upon the symptoms experienced by the individual and an overall prospect for rehabilitation or recovery. Depression over illness and treatment has also been linked to suicides among the chronically ill. Depression increases with severity of illness. The experiences of pain and disability in particular lead to depression which in turn increases the pain and disability. You see the chain reaction here. These problems are aggravated in those who are experiencing other negative life events as well, social stress and lack of social support. Let us basically look at the initial reactions to a chronic illness. By observing patients in rehabilitation and health settings, Franklin Shons described a sequence of reactions that people tend to exhibit following the diagnosis of a serious illness. The first reaction in this sequence is shock. It occurs to some degree in any crisis situation people experience, understandably. But it is likely to be more pronounced when the crisis comes without warning. Shock appears to be an emergency reaction marked by three characteristics. The first and foremost, being stunned or bewildered, second behaving in an automatic fashion and third feeling a sense of detachment from the situation. The shock phase may last for a short while or may continue for weeks for that matter. Now the second phase in responding to diagnosis is an encounter reaction which is characterized by disorganized thinking and feelings of loss, grief, helplessness, despair. During this phase, people often feel overwhelmed by reality and seem unable to reason or plan effectively in efforts to solve problems that arise as a result of the chronic illness and also to improve their situation. Because encounter reactions are intensely stressful, many people, many patients begin to cope by using avoidance strategies, particularly denial. Remember, we have just discussed about denial. This marks the start of the third phase, which is called retreat. Individuals in the retreat phase tend to deny either the existence of the health problem or its implications. But this state of affairs generally cannot last and reality begins to intrude, it dawns. The condition does not go away, additional diagnosis confirm the original one. The symptoms get worse and the patient keeps getting reminders from the people around that the illness exists and adjustments need to be made. Using retreat as a base of operation, these patients now tend to contact reality a little at a time until they adjust fully to the health problem and its implications. Now having discussed all these, let us also remember that all individuals may not react in the ways that Shans has described when they are faced with such a crisis as being diagnosed with a serious illness, but probably most do. We have been discussing upon negative aspects of illness so far. Aren't there any positive effects at all in any person? Well, there are many people who with chronic illnesses have reported certain positive changes to their lives. This is referred to as stress related growth or post traumatic growth or benefit finding. 
three main types of positive changes are uh, reported by studies. One is the enhanced relationships. Patients need support from others and positive interpersonal experience may strengthen their appreciation of relationships. A changed view of themselves is the second positive change. People may develop a greater sense of personal resilience and strength and acceptance to the vulnerabilities of their own vulnerabilities and limitations as well or a heightened awareness of the fragility of life. The, the third um, change, positive change is a changed life philosophy. The concern that illness might result in incapacity and a shorter life can lead to changes in priorities and values. A different approach to life and a greater appreciation of being. These positive changes thus can lead to a whole new approach towards life. So far we have been discussing about various positive and negative consequences of chronic illnesses. Having said that there is a chronic illness, having confirmed that there is a chronic illness, there are bound to be certain changes. But what can be done? What are the various interventions for people with chronic conditions? That is what we are going to discuss now. We have discussed that there are reliable adverse effects of chronic disease such as anxiety, depression, we said disturbances in interpersonal relationships. Increasingly depression, psychological distress and neuroticism are being targeted for interventions. In addition, because stress aggravates so many uh, chronic diseases and conditions, assistance in managing the demands of daily life may be required. Consequently, Health psychologists have increasingly been focusing upon the ways to ameliorate these problems. Ideally, intervention programs to help individuals with chronic health conditions or health problems involve interdisciplinary teams of professionals. Can you tell me who all may be involved in that? Physicians, nurses, health psychologists, physical and occupational therapists, vocational counsellors, social workers, recreational therapists, all will have to work together in an integrated fashion. Now, can you tell me what is the role of a health psychologist in this? Health psychologists contribute to this process of helping the individual by helping each client cope with the psychosocial implications of his or her medical condition and using behavioral and cognitive principles to enhance the person's participation in and adherence to therapeutic regimen. That will be the role of a psychologist. So now let us talk about various interventions. First and foremost, we are bound to talk about pharmacological intervention, that is medical intervention with using medicines. A chief target of pharmacological intervention is depression. Antidepressants are fairly commonly prescribed under such circumstances, especially if the prognosis is poor. In addition to that, the second intervention that we need to very uh, importantly discuss about is education and support services. The first thing chronically ill people and their families need to help them adapt to a health problem is correct information about the disease and its prognosis and treatment. Patient education programs that include coping skills training relevant to particular disorders have been found to improve functioning for a broad variety of chronic uh, health problems including end-stage renal disease, stroke, cardiovascular disease, cancer according to certain studies. Studies have also demonstrated that such programs can increase knowledge about the disease reduce anxiety, increase patients feelings about the purpose and meaning in life, reduce pain and depression, improve coping, increase adherence to treatment and increase confidence in the ability to manage pain as well as other side effects. Effective systems of social support on the other hand also increase patients, enhance patients and their families adaptation to chronic health problems. Patients usually receive this support basically from family or friends. 
but it can also come from support groups that offer patients and their families or their family members information and opportunities to meet with people who are traveling in the same boat which means people who are suffering the same way. For example, support groups for Alzheimer families. They help them by providing information, giving sensitive emotional support and sharing members own experiences and ways of dealing with everyday problems as well as difficult decisions. Let us go a little more into this training and education. Training and education programs to promote correct self-care procedures are very important in helping patients and their families adapt to the illness. These programs can be provided by professionals in the medical settings or by trained persons such as in the support groups. Some of these methods involve improving the way the practitioners provide the information about the procedures and the importance of following and sticking to the treatment regimen. Behavioral methods are used such as tailoring the regimen and making it as compatible as possible with the person's habits, using prompts and reminders, having patients keep record of their self-care activities and providing a system of rewards through the method of contingency contracting. Chronically ill patients who report good social relationships are, according to studies, more likely to be positively adjusted to their illness. Studies have shown that social support can also influence health outcomes favorably, thus promoting recovery or longevity. Patients need to recognize the potential sources of support in their environment and be taught how to draw on these resources effectively. For example, patients might be urged to join community groups, interest groups, informal social groups and self-help groups as well. Now, social support groups represent a resource for the chronically ill patients like stroke patients, patients recovering from myocardial infarction and cancer patients and others. Some of these groups may be initiated by the therapist himself or herself and in some cases they are also patient led. These groups discuss issues of mutual concern and that arise as a consequence of illness. Researchers have concluded that such groups, support groups, often provide specific information about how others are being able to successfully deal with their problems raised by the illness and provide people with an opportunity to share their emotional responses with others facing same or similar problems. Another intervention that we need to discuss about is relaxation and biofeedback. Stress and anxiety as we already discussed can aggravate chronic conditions like decreasing for example a diabetic's ability to metabolize uh, glucose or in asthmatics triggering or worsening asthmatic asthma attacks. As a result psychologists use stress management techniques, techniques like progressive muscle relaxation, biofeedback, systematic desensitization and other relaxation techniques to help patients control these psychosocial factors which may be affecting them. Studies have generally found that I am going to tell you about certain findings that the studies have uh, shown. These approaches that we have mentioned about are effective and provide useful supplements to medical treatment for asthma. People with epilepsy can benefit from both relaxation as well as biofeedback training which we have just mentioned. Relaxation training can decrease anxiety and nausea from chemotherapy and decreases pain also for cancer patients. Combination of relaxation training with stress management and blood pressure monitoring has proven useful in the treatment of essential hypertension and asthma. All that I have just quoted was based upon study findings. Now let's come to another approach which is used as an intervention that is cognitive approaches are designed to analyze and change incorrect beliefs and help individuals learn and use effective coping strategies. Many patients and their families experience strong feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, depression. In the case of Alzheimer's disease, some studies have found that 40% 
or more of the caregivers of the patients show severe levels of depression. One cognitive approach that can help people overcome depressive feelings is cognitive restructuring. Whereby individuals or groups of patients discuss incorrect stressful thoughts and beliefs and replace them with more constructive as well as realistic thoughts. Nowadays computerized cognitive therapy treatments for anxiety and depression are already widely used and evidence also shows that they are effective. Another therapy which I need to mention as an intervention is insight oriented therapy which is designed to help people gain an understanding of the roots of their feelings and problems. This approach is especially useful in helping patients deal with their anxieties and changes in their self-concepts or relationships with family and friends. Now we also have to talk very importantly about family therapy. Typically it has the family meet as a group and it draws heavily upon cognitive, behavioral and insight oriented methods to examine and change patterns of interaction among family members. A family with a chronically ill um, patient or member might meet together for certain things. For example, to review household and medical regimen responsibilities, discuss grievances, plan ways to alter daily routines. The activities the chronically ill person can engage in successfully to build his or her feelings of competence and self-esteem. How and when this ill person could take responsibility or improve self-care. If the patient is a child for example, um, the jealousy siblings may feel if the patient seems to be getting special attention may be discussed among the family members. Now such a family meetings and family therapy can help uncover and resolve anxieties which develop when the family dynamics and modes of interaction change in either a positive or a negative direction. One more therapy which needs to be discussed is narrative therapy where illness is talked of as a story. The events of chronic illness, positive and negative changes will become a person's story, a part of the person's story about himself or herself. Researchers say that stories or narratives have a number of functions. Like for example, they transform events and construct meaning for the illness. They help people reconstruct their history to incorporate the illness and reconstruct their identity to retain a sense of self-worth even in the face of illness. They help people examine, explain and understand their illness. They relate the illness to their values and life priorities. The importance of illness narratives is reflected in narrative based medicine. The emphasis in this is on listening to patient narratives and using them to improve clinical care. How is this done? In diagnosis, narratives are useful because they provide an insight into someone's experience of ill health and encourage empathy and understanding between doctor and patient. Narratives encourage a holistic approach to treatment. Talking through illness narratives can provide therapeutic and palliative for patients. In addition, it may also suggest other treatment options. In patient education, narratives are memorable, grounded in experience and encourage reflection. The use of narratives can therefore be helpful both for patients as well as the doctors at many stages of illness. Further, in addition to all that we discussed so far, research is showing that even brief therapies such as those conducted over telephone have been shown to benefit patients enhancing a sense of personal control. Although many interventions focus on coping skills, others have made use of more novel techniques for attempting to improve a patient's emotional and behavioral responses to chronic illnesses. These include music, art and dance therapies. However, Despite all these advances, medical and psychosocial care for the chronically ill is still insufficient as the burden of the caregivers clearly attests. 
Consequently, managed care may need to assume responsibility for broader based behavioral and psychological approaches to improving health among the chronically ill. Research suggests that physicians and other health practitioners need better training in behavioral and psychosocial approaches as well to chronic disorders in addition to their medical training. To conclude, techniques for teaching self-management of chronic illness need to be refined and educational interventions for communicating them to patients need to be undertaken. Monitoring the success of these programs that we have been talking about is equally important. Thank you.